In this part, the idea is uh, that uh, we compare what is happening or should be happening in Italy with what is happened or should be happening in the Netherlands. And you did the same exercise for Belgium and Austria um, in a previous round. Um, so um, I think the idea is to complete the picture um, and to answer the questions uh, that were given to us uh, by um, the people in Tilburg responsible for setting up the course. Um, I was listening to a lot of the discussion and I was thinking there's maybe a very fundamental issue um, when it comes to recovery and the role of the national court, which, which you touched on at the, at the end. What is the role of the national court? Um, in my experience, state aid is a highly political issue. When the Commission takes a decision, it's often an extremely political decision and politically motivated. And if you look at the level of judicial protection in state aid or uh, fairness to the beneficiary, it's dreadful. Uh, it's, it's really awful. Uh, and many commentators on state aid argue that this is uh, in breach of the uh, Charter of Human Rights and all the rest, but it is, it is terrible. And of course you can appeal uh, or to annul a decision to the, the General Court uh, and eventually up to the Court of Justice. Um, but uh, the general court uh, doesn't go into great detail uh, when it comes to procedural rights. So I, I personally think uh, from my own experience that when it comes to recovery, the national courts have a very important role to play because if there's anywhere that legal principles still have a role, it's going to be there. Um, and that some fair, fairness and some sort of procedural certainty should should be guaranteed at that level. Um, that's my sort of personal experience from working in, in the field. And I was interested in the question that was raised, how do judges um, deal with the burden of proof? Is that a way of addressing some of the issues like in the media set case that was discussed? And this is a, a, a big issue in state aid. Uh, what are the rules on burden of proof? And of course, you start always uh, with the usual uh, presumption that the person making the claim has to prove the claim. Uh, but in state aid law, it's not, not always very clear uh, when the Commission can reverse the burden of proof uh, on the member state. And if there's one area where that is really, really a big issue at the moment, it's in tax law. Um, because when you are looking at whether a tax measure is an aid or not, um, now I don't want to go into a whole lecture about what is a state aid or not, but from the, the point of view of the burden of proof, the question is, is it for the Commission to say this is an exception from a benchmark uh, and for the Commission to prove that it's an exception? Or is it for the Member State to say it's not an exception, this is the benchmark, this is where, you know, and so who has the burden of proof of saying what is the benchmark? It's a really fundamental issue and hopefully, hopefully, but we can't always uh, expect too much of the European courts, but hopefully um, in the uh, world duty-free case, which you might, you might have followed, um, it began life as Banco Santander and it's changed names. Um, but in that case, which concerns Spanish legislation, um, giving preferential tax treatment um, for um, the writing off of goodwill for foreign acquisitions, uh, you might, if you followed it, know the General Court uh, annulled the Commission decision. And um, about six months ago, the European Court of Justice reinstated that decision and said the Commission was right to find that this, this um, special goodwill um, treatment uh, for foreign uh, investment was a form of state aid. So that case now goes back to the General Court. And one of the arguments that the Spanish lawyers um, for um, the tax um, 
for the, those companies having to pay the tax now are making is that the, the Court of Justice has failed to appreciate properly how the burden of proof should be allocated. So that it's going to be quite fascinating to see how that works. Really a principled case, which will be very important, I think, for national judges as well. Yeah, but one that's law, that's uh, easy. Maybe you could. Can you repeat or do, or do mention the case? It's called what, World, now it's called World Duty Free. Yeah, yeah as my said, the law in that manner, I, 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 I'm a modest uh, tax lawyer, very modest. But I think uh, in, uh, in uh, I'm, my field of study is the comparison between tax systems, apart of, from European tax law. And I can assure you that each fiscal system has different rationales from the other and uh, well, the fiscal system is the shaping of the fiscal system is uh, related to the history, to the culture, to the economy of a single state. Um, and I am comforted in this by the economic, econometric studies that uh, can fail to do, identify a perfect taxation. There is no perfect taxation. Ideal taxation. Each country has its own taxation. Its own perfect taxation. Its own preferable taxation. Um, it's very easy to identify the benchmark in this field. What is the benchmark? What, what, what is the benchmark of the tax of the uh, fiscal system? Each uh, and we in Italy. <coughs> We had uh, the, one of the few cases uh, remaining to the, to the ECJ, I'm afraid, to the ECJ uh, from National Charter is the famous case on cooperative uh, cooperatives, companies, cooperative companies. No decision of the Commission. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like nothing. It's the paid graphos. Paid graphos, paid yeah. graphos. As far as I, even without, I think, as far as I know, in each country in Europe, there are some cooperative companies, and uh, the fiscal system provides for this sort of company a special regime that could be favorable and that could be not favorable. Yeah. There is a different benchmark in any case. <coughs> companies. Capital companies are different from cooperative companies in each system of European Union, of, uh, of each member state. And so, now, the European Commission, the, some Italian judge was doubtful that the regime, the fiscal regime, granted to the cooperative companies was a, was a state act. But, as Leg said, what is the benchmark? Mm -hmm. Cooperative companies are, di are different from uh, capital companies. And the main problem, uh, and we come back to what, what like I said in the very beginning, that's uh, the main point. That's a political question. In, 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 in the end, uh, um, the decision of what is the benchmark is a political question. And this political question is up to each state, or it, it, is it up to the European Commission? That's the mm -hmm. that's the main the big, uh, issue, the, yeah. the, the main, uh, the big issue we confronted up to now, and then we we would like to cover these political issues with uh, some technical rules, technical yeah. definition mm -hmm. of the market, the perfect market, perfect competition market, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, I took comfort also from the recent, I said. Uh, um, also, today, this uh, um, proaction of the European Commission in uh, tax ruling mm -hmm. is clearly unacceptable from the tax point of view, from the tax lawyer point of view. That the European Commission is saying uh, to the tax administration, you granted an, an, an advantage to, 
the sustain company's financial risk could be from growing. But in the end, I think also, uh, this is my opinion, uh, in the end, uh, it will be a political movement as well. It's a way to foster taxation, to foster the, the, the developing uh, in uh, harmonizing uh, direct yeah. taxation. Mm -hmm. And it is not just mine, as I know, it's yeah. not just mine uh, thought, it is well, well known about the lawyer and politicians mm. in the European Union. This. And in the end, so I, I agree, I agree totally. Above all, the, the main issue is political and is who uh, state who is in charge to stay the benchmark, the, the benchmark for all European economy or European society, I would say. That's, that's the main point, I think, in the, in the state and I identification rules. That's all. Thank you. But it can come down to the very legal question of, of who has that burden of proof. And that was, I think, a very important point that you made. Uh, that goes right through state aid law. It's very uncertain at the moment. Uh, there are some presumptions, as I mentioned, but in fact, those presumptions are very easily then put aside and then the, the, the burden shifts in state aid law. Um, and so that, I think, is a role for national judges to be very uh, yeah, alert as to how that is happening. So the questionnaire um, asks us, um, to compare then between the countries uh, quite easily. The first question, whether we have a specific state aid recovery procedure for fiscal state aid, or whether it's still uh, based on civil or administrative procedures. So I think for Italy, the answer is there's supposed to be a special regime now. Um, although you special, generally, special general regime. Yes, yes. Although the question of whether the exclusive competence for the administrative court is uh, constitutional is still yeah. subject to debate. Yeah, there are some constitutional doubts about My, I had a question about that um, when I was listening to your talk. I mean, the, lo the law is from 2012. Um, is there a, a period of limitation to challenge the constitutionality no, of that? No, there is not. No, that there is can not. be any, yeah. at any time. Any time it could be challenged before the Constitutional Court, mm. and uh, it could be challenged just only by uh, by sending of uh, from national judge. I mean, uh, we have uh, in Italy we have a, a control by our constitutional courts that is uh, spread on the national judge. Mm. Each judge, when he is doubtful about the uh, the constitutionality of uh, a court, of a law, would refer to the to the European to the Court of Constitutional Court. Mm. More or less like uh, ECJ. Yeah. Like the yeah. To the ECJ. Okay. And then the Constitutional Court the judge uh, and can assume. But the fact is that when the Constitutional Court uh, question out a law, uh, Declaring it constitutional. Yeah. This, this declaration, this is, this judgment has retroactive effect. Okay. So, as as it never happened, as it never happened, mm. it never existed. So we experience it right now. We can have a declaration of inconstitutional by constitutional yeah. court, and uh, it will take effect. But exclude from the yeah. very beginning of right. the from 2012. Okay. Yeah. But this uh, it is not easy to go to the court because uh, I can imagine someone that uh, sued a challenge a decision mm -hmm. before a tax tax judge. Yeah. And this tax judge has to say, yes, I am not in confident, but uh, according to the law, I'm not. I'm 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 competent according to the very nature of the sum to be recovered, but I'm not according to the law. Yeah. So I'm doubtful about this law. It's not coherent with our constitution that yeah. forbids the attribute the free attribution yeah. of contract, and so refer to the European to the constitution of court. Yeah. That's that's the way to go before the right. the constitution. So that could well happen. 
Yeah, it's cool. And could it happen in the other situation where it's the administrative judge, which is a... Uh, yeah, yeah, but it, yeah, it could be happen. The question is the phone conference. Yeah, it could happen. It's not that it doesn't, because uh, the administrative judge is allowed <coughs> to affirm not that the judge, that the yeah, law yeah. attributing it because it is very competent, uh, it is not fair in the constitutional point of view. But it is clearly responsible. And would the, would the Constitutional Court, if they upheld then the tax judge, would that be um, a, then a general ruling or would it be a, for each individual case? No, general. They never have. As, as the okay. never, so, ex -tunk, the whole law. Yeah, yeah, it's all Like this in Yes. Can the Constitutional Court Ah, that's why I don't understand. <laughs> No. The, Did you all hear that question? Sorry. Sorry. Oh, no. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. I mean? My question was of the Constitutional Court in Italy can adjust the retroactivity of this decision. Uh, because okay. oh, in yeah. some countries, the uh, budget of the Limit the retroactivity. So, when he has a retroactivity. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was wondering how many so. GDTs he said before. No. In, uh, <coughs> Up to 2015, it never did. In 2015, we experienced the first case in which the court, for in tax matter, in tax matter, because we, uh, we have to declare the inconstitutionality of the, the court, declare the inconstitutionality of the taxation, and so the state had to we pay, we find uh, what has been paid by the very beginning of this tax. But the court, for financial reason, limited this effect. Uh, this okay. Yeah, no constitutional court. No. There is no constitutional court. No. There is no constitutional court. No. There is no possibility to um, uh, challenge. To challenge the tax law to the constitution. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's not. That's not. Ah. Yeah. In the Netherlands. Yeah. Italy exists. Yeah. Italy exists. Yeah. It is not challenging, but it is uh, this quite different because it is more much very like uh, similar to very similar to the preliminary ruling to the ECJ how the Constitutional Court judge because uh, the nation the ordinary judge has to ask the Constitutional Court. I am doubtful about the coherence of the Constitution of this internal law. Could you please assure me that this uh, law is in coherent with the Constitution? It's a sort of cooperation and not, not challenging uh, in, in proper term. But, but, but more in, in, in the end it's challenging because the Constitutional Court could question uh, question out the law and so declare it uh, unconstitutional. And so, if the, our constitutional court uh, did that, uh, as I said, the law has been, is considered as never existed. Mm -hmm. There is a retroactive effect of what our constitutional law. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, one case in 2015. Yeah, for taxation. The only one. The only one where in which the court stated it clearly, applied it this adjustment clearly. It stated yes. In theory, my my pronunciation should have effect should have effect from the very beginning. But what? for uh, financial reason, we are experiencing financial crisis. The public debt is high. So I reduce, I adjust, and I say that the taxation should be not, the unconstitutional tax shall not be repaid, but this, sen this sentence, this uh, judgment will take place by now onward. Prospective overrun. Yeah. Yeah, that's, sorry. So I think uh, when we look at the Netherlands, of course, we don't have yet a specific system. So tax for fiscal state aid, 
uh, recovery could be based on any of the three procedures we discussed, uh, civil administrative or through the task force, obviously. Um, so the next question is, if we have a specific procedure, when was it adopted? So that's easy for Italy, 2012, and we're still waiting in the Netherlands. Um, the next, so that's that question we can deal with very quickly. The, the third question was, why do, we, why do certain countries like Italy have a specific recovery procedure? Um, and they asked, what were the problems arising from the application of civil or administrative law uh, that led to the adoption of the procedure? And I think for both countries, what's really interesting is it's been the pressure from the European Commission to resolve the situation. Um, which uh, I think in the Netherlands, as I explained, this flooring case uh, resulted in an infringement procedure which was then withdrawn um, because the, the Dutch government promised to introduce an act on recovery uh, in 2008. And in the Italian case, the, the Christmas present in 2012 came also as a, as a result of uh, commission pressure. Although we don't seem to have had a clear case there. It was just linked to a general um, disfas dissatisfaction yeah. on the rate of recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if, if I look quickly uh, back to Belgium and Austria, there's no general framework for recovery in those countries either. So Italy is, is really um, an exception. Yeah, there is an exception, but uh, so far the, exp the experience from Italy. Yeah, this is an exception, but I would like to. Maybe I like. Yeah. Yes, I. Uh, I'm not aware. Of, I was very good to communicate to you that the there is a mismatch in Italy between the intention of the Christmas present <laughs> and the effective. Uh, implementation of this general procedure because uh, up to now there are lots of unsolved issues related to the say that procedures there is a constitutional doubt excuse constitutional doubt so one lesson that in my modest opinion would be learned not go so not go so hard as Italy did that uh, the general procedure to be recovery is not so easy to implement, to implement, to introduce in general in our national law. Um, there are no back door, there, there are back doors, there is no way to go faster and so uh, we are we in Italy are uh, devoted to the Roman law, to the private law, and we think that when you are dealing with the payment of credit debt, you have to be very carefully to establish the uh, obligation, return, limitation. Uh, how do you the how did you? Settle this kind of this kind of model. And uh, in Italy, unfortunately, uh, we were thinking that just referring to the European uh, rules, we solved the problem. That's not that was not the case in Italy at all. We instead of instead of solve problem, we introduced much more issues. So up to now, the lesson to be learned is. Uh, yeah, it's a good thing, a general procedure, but uh, very well think of very well set up, very well, uh, yeah. very well uh, sketched out from the, and I think it's very important that the legal prediction of the each single, uh, each single country, that's the Just a question, uh, you mentioned that uh, this law, general law, has been adopted in 2012 yeah. under pressure of the Commission or the EU. No, we are quite uh, five years later, there are a lot of yeah. uncertainties. Uh, are you not again under the pressure of, of the, the, the institutions to clarify the community? 
No, no, we are not. We are not on the. We are not on the pressure. Uh, at least, uh, not as far as I know. Because I guess that the, the purpose of the yeah, no, the you is to put together an effective instrument, yeah, not yeah, just a paper. Yeah, yeah, you, you are right. Uh, you are right. But uh, I have to add uh, that in from 2012 on the world, we started to um, a very strict approach at the normative level of granting state aid. We are very keen, we are very careful, and we notify everything. We, know, we are an over notifying state in the European Union. So, DG competition is uh, plenty of information from here that uh, from uh, 2012 onward, in the same uh, in the same act, uh, we changed also our poly our attitude okay. to the to the state uh, and the notification. So uh, we notify lots of and so they are for the from the European Commission they are focused on uh, to mitigate our politics because we are are deemed to be too active. Yeah, too active. <laughs> okay. To active in notification of state aid to the commission. Okay, so looking uh, again um, at the questionnaire. Uh, one of the quest well, the next question was were there particular problems that had to be addressed um, because uh, separate procedures were were needed, and we've seen from the Netherlands that the two primary issues are the limitation period and the interest, trying to find a, an effective procedure to recover um, interest according to how the Commission calculates it, compound interest. And um, as uh, Professor D'Angelo explained, according to Roman law, yes. you, can't, you can't do that <coughs> um, under Italian civil law. Or, yes. uh, and in, uh, in Dutch law, the, the reason was that they, there was no written provision to base uh, that calculation upon. Um, with regard to the limitation periods, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about that, um, but that um, is a problem, of course, in fiscal state aid because the 10-year period applied uh, in a commission recovery decision is usually much longer than any national limitation period, whether it's the Netherlands uh, or Italy or Belgium or Austria. I think that's been a common problem. Um, and. Uh, we will have to see whether in some of the tax ruling cases this will be challenged, the Commission going back um, 10 years, um, if that is seen as uh, infringing legal rights at national level. Um, now, we could mention this famous case here, the Tariko case, yeah. if you want, no, if you're no, not exhausted. I, 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 <laughs> so we had a correspondence beforehand about a particular Italian case where the fact that the national limitation period uh, is much shorter uh, than European law um, has become a big issue. Um, and this, this is not a state aid case, it's a VAT case. It concerns VAT fraud. Um, it's called Terrico. And in this case, um, uh, the, the people accused of the fraud um, claimed, well, uh, they no longer had to repay uh, the, the VAT that had been defrauded plus the penalties because no, no of the limitation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> the three, Mr. Tariko claimed that he, he has no longer to repay the VAT and on the other side he has no longer to be prosecuted mm -hmm. for tax fraud because uh, in Italy, as I think, uh, Quite sure, certain uh, as in Belgium, um, Austria. Um, now the prosecution for crime is barred. It's, it's not unlimited in time. And it cannot be uh, started uh, in you know, whatever whenever in time. So in Italy we have uh, time limitation. We call it prescription. Prescription. We call it prescription. We have time, time limitation very short. 
and uh, the ECG and uh, de facto it was very difficult that one person, uh, one VAT fraudster should be a, a, is punished for VAT fraud due to this condemnation for the prosecution of VAT frauds. De facto, it was very difficult to punish the VAT frauds. And uh, the ECJ stated that uh, this national measure stating a too short prescription lapse of time Three years, I think. Three years, three years, three years. De facto is uh, uh, disproportionate because uh, uh, it, the, it does not grant, did not grant, the correct uh, collection of VAT. Because the primary sanction was uh, symbolic. Sanction was fictitious sanction and not, not effective sanctions. So, ECJ stated that uh, um, too short implementation of to a pro how we can link Tarico to our program in the state act. A too short implementation period, too short uh, uh, time barring link limitation for the proper implementation of European law could be assumed, could be deemed as not proportionate, so not granting effectiveness of national measures. So I thank Lai because when I like when Lai was writing me, maybe we can discuss Tariko's case. I was thinking about Tariko it is a crime of matter from the Italian tradition there is no link, there is no connection but in the end the line was right the problem is the same a too short time limitation period for the correct implementation of the European law could be deemed as disproportionate and so and so the CJ stated this, and uh, perhaps it is coherent in this way with the 10 years limitation. Because 10 year limitation perhaps is disproportionate so far, it is too long, but it is firm. The ECJ is stating that a too short term to recovery could be disproportionate because it does not, as I said, it does not grant proper and effective implementation of the, uh, the European, generally speaking, the European law. But in the end, Tariko is known for, we was talking about, in the end, Tariko is a modern European saga, <laughs> so we have lots of uh, uh, we, we sending very questions for the ECJ because uh, uh, for all reason, for constitutional limitation, our constitutional court uh, referred to the ECJ claiming that uh, the ECJ cannot interfere in the criminal crime on methods, Italian crime on methods, and so it cannot state that uh, time limitation for prosecution is proportionate or not, or not proportionate because it is in the jurisdiction of Italy, it does not be conferred to the European Union, we have, we have uh, um, a supreme principle of uh, reservation to the national law of uh, to the national law of uh, stating you know, what is this prescription, this yeah. time limitation. Th th that these are all those <laughs> questions, high level questions referred to the to the maybe I am exaggerating, but exaggerating by uh, these questions involved to the entire appartenance of Italy to the European community, uh, to the European Union now, because uh, um, this one of the, this is the first case, uh, as far as I know, in which our constitutional court uh, amended the option to 
dismiss a ECJ ruling. Yeah, just set it aside. Yeah. 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 And that, that's the first, as far as I know, as far as I know, I'm not constitutional. Okay. <laughs> Neither am I. But I thought it was an interesting case because it showed the clash uh, of, of legal cultures. You know, we start off um, always in uh, European law and European state aid law too, um, with this, the presumption that national procedural rules uh, are autonomous, they are not harmonized. Uh, but then we get to this limitation period, which is 10 years, um, and through state aid law, we're harmonizing a certain limitation period. And one of the arguments from Tirico was this idea of retroactivity. Yeah. When Mr. Tirico was found guilty of the fraud, yeah. um, he thought that if the three-year period had elapsed, that was it, he was going free. Uh, but he got a shock because uh, he found out that you know, the normal legal norm was being set aside uh, and it was being extended then to uh, six years, I think, in the VAT case. Uh, so he claimed also that that interfered, that retroactive application interfered with his human rights. Yeah. And this also raises a dimension of, of, of to what extent can the European courts then overturn rights guaranteed by the European Convention on Human Rights and the, the European Charter? And those, I think that angle could also be interesting in some of the tax ruling cases because, but maybe you have some ideas as well. If you think that a tax assessment um, was valid and also that it can't be uh, looked at again, after a certain number of years and then you find out you were completely wrong and not only is your tax ruling going to be reassessed but it's going to go back in time for uh, 10 years when nationally I think for fiscal tax rules it's five years um, then you're maybe confronted with a very different financial situation and the difference with Tarico of course is that Tarico we're talking about criminal penalties um, but uh, they were administrative penalties, if I'm right. He wasn't going to go to prison. No crimes, no crime, no administrative crime. crime. They were, they were penalties, but it was a, a penalty. He yeah. wasn't going Speaking to go to prison. Not a problem. I mean, really, that's double, double, uh, yeah. We have an overlapping of uh, administrative and crime yeah. sanctions. Yeah, we, we have that in the Netherlands too. Yeah. 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 Probably in Belgium. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I had a so kind of a final question um, to all of you as a kind of a jury. We've heard about the Italian special legislation, and you have heard today that we will get it in the Netherlands, maybe. It looks like it. It's been refined a bit in Parliament. Uh, in Belgium, you don't have it. In Austria, you don't have it. Looking at the Italian experience, if you were to go and advise governments, um, do you think it's a good thing?